hour We're all together, together Waiting here as one It's burning in my soul It's burning in my soul If you're here, that means you're not sick, so that's good. So, uh, yeah, we know a lot of people are sick, and 
a lot of things going on at just that, that, that time. So, hey, but God is still good. And uh, we come to worship him. And, and uh, it's an awesome time to be together. I uh, want to go over a couple of announcements with you. Number one is that tonight, Deacon So Forget meeting at 445. at worship tonight. And also, Finance Committee meeting will be tonight at 7. Uh, on Tuesday, don't forget Senior Adults. Luncheon over at going to the forest. Um, those who will be able to do that, so take note of that in the ladies' Bible studies uh, this week on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, youth, we have winter retreat this this weekend. So at, if you're interested in that, still you can still go. Uh, meeting at the church to leave about five, leave at five. Meeting at five, so we could leave. Uh, going to ABC camp Friday and Saturday. So you praying for us. As we do that, um, also in the bulletin, you just look, there's a couple of dates ahead. Uh, even the summer, it'll be here before we know it, but I'm, I'm ready for some more. I, I, I live in South Louisiana for a reason. Uh, one of those things, I like the, the heat, okay? That, that cold stuff, they can leave that up to the Yankees. So, uh, but uh, it's all right. But it, it'll, it'll warm up for us eventually. But Vacation Bible School, Youth Camp, we're going to Mission Fuge this summer, Mobile, Alabama. It's been a few years since we've been there. Um, see the dates there. And then RAG Camp going to Tall Timbers and in Woodworth, which is Alexandria area. They've been there before. So um, it's a, a, lot, a lot of things uh, on, on the horizon. But it's great to be in God's house today. Worship him. At this time, we would uh, take your attendance, uh, attention to the baptistry. Uh, last Sunday, we, we had several that came, and uh, we have one that's coming today to be baptized. have some others, hopefully, um, very soon that we're going to do that with. But what a blessing to have a baptism. Now, what is baptism? Uh, baptism is an external statement of an internal faith. Uh, I, he used this illustration. I use it as well, that, that baptism is the, the wedding ring of the Christian life. Emily and I married almost 35 years ago, and I got this ring. None of you were there, not one of you. I don't know why you didn't come. But you weren't invited. You know? But I got this wedding ring 35 years ago, and I wear it as an external symbol of an internal commitment. And that's what baptism is. Baptism is something we do externally to help people see what we believe internally. And so if you've never been baptized for various reasons, whatever, but you follow Jesus, you've committed to him, I encourage you maybe today to say, you know what, I need to do that. I need to do what Jackson's getting ready to do, and I need to follow the Lord in baptism. So uh, we'll have an invitation later in the service, and I hope if God speaks to you. That's something you need to do, and uh, hopefully in the future, that as well. I want to welcome you to Bayou Vista Baptist Church. And, uh, today we're not going to do a welcome because, of, you know, we got a lot of illness going around right now. In fact, there's holes everywhere in our church. I can count this morning due to various uh, issues. we got like 30 people that are normally here that are out with illness or injury. And so um, we're going to not have the welcome, but I want to say you're welcome today. Aren't you glad to be here? Yeah. Aren't you glad to see me? But I'm glad you're here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to have Tommy come and lead us in an opening prayer. And 
uh, then we're going to start worshiping. So Tyler, Tyler's going solo today because our praise team is sick. <laughs> we're glad Tyler's not sick. He's going to do a great no, job. That's right. He's going to do a good job. Tommy, lead us, please. How y'all doing this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Lord, I thank you for each individual that's here today, Lord. I hope you speak to them today, Lord. If they don't know you, I pray they accept you like J uh, Jackson just did and be baptized, Lord. Lord, I pray that for the words come out of Brother Steve today that it would stir your heart and move your spirit today, Lord. Be with all the ones that are sick, Lord. Just put your healing hand on them, Lord, and just heal them, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do today. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship this morning.
have within me, I give you praise. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart and I give you my soul. Every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. my heart and I give you my soul I live for you alone every breath that I take every moment I'm awake Lord have your way in me Lord have your in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the lord jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus Trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I endure Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more yes tis sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus oh for grace to trust 
trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him.
that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love in your Laying yourself down, raising up the broken to life. Amazing. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love. Praise God for the opportunity to be in His house. And I know you enjoyed sitting down, but I need you to stand back up. We're reading His Word now. So, And uh, that picture was not from this morning. Uh, it was frosty, but not quite like that. But, uh, and thank God it was not. Galatians 6, we'll begin with uh, verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's pray. Oh God, do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. And Lord, in a season where there just seems to be so much sickness, uh, God, may we give thanks that you, Father, get us through. You get us through the times of being down, that your grace is amazing and you lift us up. And, and God, our room is full of people with testimonies of how you've come to us and got us through the difficult days. And today, God, may we hear something from you. Uh, may this message speak to people on different levels, those listening online as well as those in the room. Uh, may your, your, your word, God, just encourage us and challenge us, but change us. I do want to thank you this morning, God, for, for Jackson's decision and his baptism. I pray today will be a day that's etched in his mind and, and that you might move in others that need to do the same. In Christ's name, amen. You can go ahead and be seated. <clears throat> Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They were sinless. Why did they mess up? Why did Adam and Eve mess up? Adam and Eve messed up because they chose to mess up. They chose to make a decision. And here's why they made the decision they did. And this is really going to be the crux of our message today as we look at a lot of things related to this. Adam and Eve looked at the short term rather than the long term. Let me tell you this. Most decisions in life that get you in trouble, you're looking at the short term 
rather than the long term. Most of the major mistakes you make in life, you're looking at the short term feeling and gratification rather than the long term consequences. And that's what the devil is all about. Let me tell you what Satan does, and I believe in the devil. I believe the Bible teaches us the devil. And so therefore, we need not marginalize that there's a devil. The devil, and this is a rule in life. This is not something that's my opinion. It it has proven itself out over the years. If ever you are tempted to do something that promotes a short-term pleasure, know it's probably of the devil. If it causes you to diminish the long-term pleasure consequences. That is a a truth of life. Most of the time when we do wrong things, it's because we're not thinking of the big picture. We're not thinking of the will of God. We're thinking of the here and the now. Let me give you several examples of that. Why do people commit crimes? Because they're not thinking about going to jail. They're thinking about what they can get right now They're thinking of what they can benefit with by stealing or by harming or by doing whatever they do when they're not looking at the big picture. What about people in terms of spiritual things? Why do people miss out on God's calling for their life? Uh, I'll use the example of ministry. Why does somebody that's called today not go into ministry? Because it's difficult right now. It's not because of the long run. It's because of the, the right now. And I was talking to somebody not long ago that I, I said, um, I understand you've gone into, you've been called into ministry late in life. And their, their answer was, no, I obeyed late in life. And so I, I think that is really what we see with a lot of people. We're thinking in the, the now. What do I need to do now? Is it painful now? Is it a struggle now? Or is it right now? I'll give you another example that um, it's, it's a very touchy subject in our culture, but it's something that we, we certainly know much about, uh, the issue of abortion. Why do people mostly get abortions? Over 90% are because of the now, because of the convenience of the now. But I would assure you of this, most people that got one think about it the rest of their lives because the problem was dealt with in the now, but it didn't erase the problem because the problem is in their mind the rest of their lives. I would just venture to say this because obviously I haven't had one as a man, but I do know this, that if you, I would assume this would happen if it happened 20 years ago. Every time you see a 20-year-old, you're wondering about the what-ifs. You see, because everything Satan promotes is in the immediate for the most part. And God always looks at the, the long term. When you say no to God about small things in the now... He probably won't ask you to do large things in the later. Listen to me. If you don't listen to the small things of God now, you probably are not offered the opportunity for large things in the later. And so if you've gotten older and said, well, God never asked me to do anything. You know why? Because when he asked you to do things in the past, you said no. Or you said later. Or you said it's not convenient. Because here's the deal with God. He calls you in the now to do things that affect you in the later. And if you won't respond in the now, he may not call you in the later. I want to speak today on some subjects that I I think would help a lot of us in this room, as well as those watching today. And our title is Current Decisions with Long-Term Consequences. Current decisions, things we need to think about today uh, that will have implications for years and decades to come. So let's look at four different areas that I think will help you as you look at your life. First of all, the long-term consequences of sin and salvation. We're going to look at sin and salvation under the same tent because they, they really have the same issue. Sin keeps us from God. Salvation draws us to God. And I've got to make a decision if I want to keep my sin or I want to return from my sin to salvation. And it is a long-term decision made in the immediate. A saying I heard years ago that... Uh, you need to know this by heart if you don't, don't now. I've quoted it years and years and I've been here. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Remember that. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. 
Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. Sin is about now, but you never get over it because it normally has implications for later. Sin always overpromises pleasure and underestimates pain. Sin always says it's going to be better than it really is, and it always marginalizes the cost in the long run. Our culture is so full of people that can say, yes, I agree, but I didn't know it then, and I'm dealing with the implications of it now. Let's look back at our text, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let's think of the concepts of sin and salvation. If you keep planting sin, you will keep harvesting what sin grows into, right? You plant sin, sin grows into something that's of the same nature as sin. But if today I say I'm tired of planting sin and I want to give my heart to Jesus and I want to make a decision of faith, as Jackson did a week ago, and I want to turn my life over to Christ, here's what I'm saying. I'm no longer going to be planting the desires of sin. I'm going to plant that which pleases God that is based upon faith through the grace of of God, based upon what he did on the cross, then the harvest of my life changes. But here's what's key to that, and this is so important. We live in a day where everything is so instantaneous. We go ahead, we turn our television on, we can get a satellite signal and watch thousands of videos. We want it immediately. We want to go through the drive through and get it in three minutes. And, you know, everything's got to be fast. If we go to the bank and the teller doesn't respond with our deposit back in three or four minutes, we kind of get upset. And I can't tell you the number of people that won't sit at the red light at the end of the boulevard. You ever notice that? I'm at that red light all the time, and it's like, it says, no turn on red. But I'm in a hurry, I'm in a hurry, I'm in a hurry. Everybody wants everything fast. Let me tell you right now, anything that's promoting fast is oftentimes to your detriment. Long-term consequences matter. So if I plant sin now... Uh, I will grow fruit from sin later. If I plant salvation now, I will get the fruit of salvation later. I heard a guy some years ago that um, gave what's called the laws of sowing and reaping. Uh, Maybe you've heard this before. I I think it's tremendous, something worth writing down. Three laws of sowing and reaping. And this is true for sin. It's true for salvation. Number one, you always reap according to what you sow. You always reap according to what you sow. So if I plant corn, what am I going to reap? Corn. If I plant beans, what am I going to get? Beans. If I, if I plant an orange tree, what am I going to get? Oranges. So whatever you plant, which will be a singular seed, you're going to get that later. You all, listen to me. Second thing, you always reap more than you plant. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it, would you? I I plant one kernel of corn. How many kernels of corn come out of that? Hundreds. So I always will reap more than I sow. Always. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. It'd be a waste of time. So I plant one pit. I plant one seed. I get thousands upon thousands more than than I sow when I reap. And thirdly, you always reap later than you sow. So think about that. You always reap according to what you sow. You always reap later than you sow. You always reap more than you sow. That's that's a rule of life. There is no debate there. Would you disagree with me? I mean, that's just the, the fact of life. What you plant, you get according to what you plant. You get more than what you plant. You get later than what you plant. So If right now you say, Brother Steve, everything that's coming out of my life, I don't like it. Well, let me tell you what that's probably got to do with. Where did you plant in the past? What you planted in the past determines what you generally get in the future. Now, sometimes life just doesn't work out. Like COVID. If you got COVID, God, why'd you give me COVID? And God would say, everybody's getting COVID. It's kind of like this. God, why am I getting old? Well, thank God you're getting old. Anybody getting old out there? You, do you feel it? 
when it's 32 degrees in the morning in South Louisiana and you go, oh, and you get the aches and pains. Tommy, you know what I'm talking about, right? You get those aches and pains and you moan and you groan and you go, wow, where's the Ben Gay? You know what I'm talking about. You want to go ahead and, and deal with that. But that's just part of life. Some of that's not because you did anything wrong. Some of that's the human condition. But a lot of life is about the fact that we sowed sin and we're harvesting what sin produces. But if you sow God, the righteousness of God, the truth of God, then later the harvest is of the character of God. Sin and salvation are vastly different seeds, and they produce vastly vastly different results. Notice what Paul says about his life. He gives a picture of what he used to be and what he became, and it was because he changed the seeds of his life. 1 Timothy 1 Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me the worst of sinners... Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Here's what Paul's saying. I planted sin. I planted sin. I planted sin. I planted evil. I planted animosity. I planted bitterness. And I reaped it. And I reaped it. And I reaped it. And then one day God reached down and gave me another chance. And when I started planting changed. And when I started reaping changed. Listen to me. It's never too late to get right with God. But I will tell you this. If you planted seeds of sin 20 years ago, you'll reap the consequences even after you get saved. Because that's just the nature of this life. But at least I would be able to do it knowing, you know what, God? I'm changing direction. I'm changing my mindset. I'm changing my focus. And so if I plant sin, I get a life and character with that. And if I receive the Lord Jesus as Savior, just as we talked about last Sunday in both services, then I I receive eternal life and I have joy and I have peace. Joy and and peace. I had the privilege on Friday to go see my mom at the uh, facility she's in over in Picayune. Mom will be 89 next month. Thank God for that. That's a wonderful thing. Miss Jean, you just had a birthday. Your mom just a short distance apart. Thank you. You're here today. And uh, I'm thankful my mom, as long as I've known her, and she's far from perfect, by the way. And by the way, you are too. You're far from perfect. But but mom, I've seen in her life, she she tried to plant seeds uh, that today she's still reaping. uh, And she's saved. And she knows it. And I thank God for that. You know what's great about getting old is looking back and remembering the seeds that you planted and how God allowed you to reap uh, the blessings of being faithful. What about eternity? Well, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, it says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. If your name's not found in the book of life, you're thrown into the lake of fire. That's the ultimate in sowing and reaping. You see, what I do with God today leads to one day reaping. God opens the book. And am I there? Am I in the book? Are you in the book? I'm in the book. Donald, are you in the book? I'm in the book. Tom, are you in the book? Do you know if you're in the book? Well, why would I be in the book, Brother Steve? Well, there was a, t- a place in time where you said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've been reaping the cost of sin because I've been sowing sin, and I don't like it, and I realize I'm separated from you, and I realize you intervened, and you sent your son to die for me, and he took the penalty of my sin upon himself. He became the substitute for me, and I want Jesus to be my redemption and my hope. And when we do that, when we turn our lives over to him, the Bible says that our names are written in the book. Is your name in the book? Is your name in the book? 
Brother says, I don't know if my name's in the book. Well, that's a bad response. Because if you don't know if your name's in the book, then you're saying, I haven't sowed the seed of salvation. If you haven't sowed the seed of salvation, you're still sowing the seeds of sin. Have you come to the place in your life of knowing for certain that your name's in the book? The long-term consequences of sin is if we don't get right with God, we're eternally lost. But if we say yes to Jesus, we're eternally saved. That is the ultimate long-term consequences of sin and salvation. Let's see the second thing. There's long-term consequences of church attendance. Aren't you glad you're here today? I was thinking back when I was writing this message earlier this week, and you might not believe me, but folks, I, I don't remember this being the case. I have not missed three Sundays in a row since I was five years of age. Now, we went on vacation some, and we wouldn't go, or I got sick, or maybe we were out of town for two weeks. But I don't ever recall in my life, now part of that's being a pastor, that helps, but I don't ever remember, even before that, missing church three weeks in a row. Now, if I were to ask some of you this, and some of you watching on, on the uh, Internet today, when was the last time you went three weeks in a row? I can't remember missing three weeks in a row my entire childhood. And folks, I'm 56. That's over 50 years. I thank God for that. Amen. Because, because my parents sowed church in me as a child, it reaped a harvest in my life. And now I, I've sowed it and, and kept doing it. We've done it with our kids. And, you know, hopefully they're doing it themselves. But church defines me. It's, it's who I am. What about, is it who you are? And as a teenager, Paul, I liked going to church. I, I didn't fight my parents about, oh, i got to get up, let me sleep in. I never did that. I, I loved going to church, Tyler. You know, I think you did too. That's why you're playing music right up here. I, I loved it, Emily. I think you loved going to church. I think your kids like it. I, I loved going to church. You know why? Because it defined me. It, it was who I was. My kids fight me about going to church. Let me just tell you this. They'll thank you if you win the fight. They'll thank you, parents, for winning that fight. I cannot imagine my life without the church defining me and giving me important relationships that go back for decades. That's why in the early 20s, God called me to ministry because it, it was, I was already there. This is the truth about you. God can take you where he wants you when you're close to there already. When you're far from where he wants you, it's harder to get you there because it's more of a battle. That's why we need to plant the seeds and plant the seeds and get saved and, and our kids come to faith and, and hopefully they're making progress so the next calling of God is not that hard to make the leap toward can you imagine life without church? Um, I stay in touch with our dear friends in Canada. You know, our church has been in Nova Scotia a bunch, and it's been a couple of years now because of COVID, but uh, I was um, actually texting one of the pastors up there the other day, and I shared this Wednesday night, but a lot of you weren't here, but, so I want to mention this to you. Today in Canada, okay, because of COVID, right now in Canada, they're only allowed 25% of capacity two years into this thing. And catch this, right now in Canada, at least in Nova Scotia, they're not allowed to sing in church. Okay, March will be two years. In Nova Scotia this morning, they're at 25% of seating capacity, and they're not allowed to sing in church. Let me tell you why that happens. Listen to me. If, uh, this is very important. I'll tell you why that happens in Canada. Because those who go to church in Canada are so small, they can't fight back. I, I pulled a statistic up uh, the other day, and this kind of shocked me. You'll go, really? Yep, this is true. A survey of Canadians finds that since the pandemic, 67% of Canadians never go to church. Two out of three Canadians never go to church. Yet of that group, 60% say they strongly believe in God. 67% never go to church, but 60% say they still believe strongly in God. Now, here's what I would say to that. 
The government can take away church only when we allow them to. You hear what I'm saying? Who can take away your practice in your life? Only you. You surrender that. That won't happen in in Louisiana. That's why two years into this thing, we're having full-blown church. I was texting him, I said, we have absolutely no restrictions in Louisiana. You want to come, you come. You want to wear a mask, you mask. And we're going to sing and we're going to have church. Why is that? Because in Louisiana, that's crazy, crazy Cajuns. We'd fight it, wouldn't we? But in Canada, they've just kind of gone along with it. And I love our Canadian friends, but here's what happens. This is just true in life. The more you give in and the more you give in and the more you give in, the more you lose and the more you lose and the more you lose. That's true with sin and that's true with faith. What's the long-term consequences in our, our, our neighboring nation? If things don't change, they're going to be in a far different place than they were just three years ago. Church, we need to know the long-term consequences of attending church. It is that important. What we do today determines what we can do tomorrow. Take the privilege seriously. In Hebrews 10, it says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, there's a key phrase there. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Do you know most of what we do in life is habitual? I do almost the same thing the first 30 minutes of every morning. Are you like that? Are you a creature of habit the first 30 minutes of the day? I mean, you're just that predictable. And that carries over to other things, too. Carries over to every Sunday. Am I going to go to church? Well, it's going to be pretty predictable. Either you do or you don't. It becomes a habit of life. What you do now determines your habits later and I think that's really the issue we have uh, with, you know, people not coming during the last two years. It's not that people have gotten rebellious. It's that people have gotten in a habit. Now, I mean, we know COVID's real. People have it. Right now it's becoming more like a cold with this last variant. It's not as, as dangerous. I don't know there's people that are vulnerable. I'm not trying to diminish that at all. And if you've got underlying conditions, stay home. I get it. But for those that are young and healthy and and that generally are in a good place, be faithful, amen? Be faithful if you can. Because you're developing habits for the rest of your life. Listen, you're going to live longer than COVID, most of you. And what are you going to be on the other side of it? What are the habits of your life? You know, right now we're in the football playoffs. I, was, I, I put this on Facebook last night. I'm watching the uh, Green Bay Packers and San Francisco 49ers. Anybody watch that game? And uh, I was pulling for the Packers, by the way, but uh, they lost. And so I'm watching the game, and I'm thinking, the stadium is packed. I mean, it, they're all they're shoulder to shoulder in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It is 12 degrees with a wind chill of zero and they showed pictures of the lights, and the snow is just coming down. And I'm thinking, I bet every one of those are in church tomorrow. Every one of them. They're all thinking, man, I hope this game ends, and we're going to go to church tomorrow, right? I'd be curious to know what percentage of those didn't get up and go to church. Well, brother, see, I can't get up and go to church. You know, it's cold outside. I'm thinking... As a guy told me years ago, we do what we want to do. I think I'll get back in church when COVID ends. Can I tell you something? COVID is not going to end. Has the flu ever ended? Has the common cold ended? No, common cold's a coronavirus. It's just got a different name. COVID's a coronavirus. We've had coronaviruses our whole lives. Guess what? We're not going to get rid of Viruses. So I've got to decide to make a habit now because it will affect me for the rest of my life. 
In Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They met every day in the early church. In the modern church, I don't know if you've noticed, we have less services in the average church today than we did 25 years ago. I was talking to our evangelist last week in St. Mary Parish. If you were to look at our churches, and this would be of all denominations, well less than half have a Sunday night service anymore. And in Southern Baptist churches, only a quarter have Sunday night services. I never knew of a church growing up that didn't have Sunday night services. It doesn't make you more spiritual necessarily, but I'll tell you this. The more I can be with you and the more I can be with God and the more I can have exposure to the things of God, it has long-term consequences about the flavor of my life and what I value. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Those that I am around impact my life. I'm glad I'm in the church. I'm glad to be a pastor. Why? Because the most important people to who I am were church people. They have formed my life. Paul, there was a song years ago. You remember this came out in the 80s. And in fact, some of you can start singing it. You can say, Brother C, I can't get it out of my head. You just brought it up. I haven't thought about it in years. Remember the song Friends by Michael W. Smith? It said this, And friends are friends forever, if the Lord's the Lord of them. And a friend will not say never, because the welcome will not end. Though it's hard to let you go, in the Father's hands we know, but a lifetime's not too long to live as friends. A friendship's in the body of Christ. So thankful that God allowed me the privilege of developing the short-term habits that developed into long-term habits because of the church. Look at the third thing. We'll move on. The long-term consequences of spiritual disciplines. What about your personal spiritual disciplines? What do you do in, in your daily life? Now, we talk about this a lot because it's that important. Faith is a relationship with God. And what I do in private with God determines what I am in public with God and with you. You know, we've promoted for years about reading through the Bible, have a Bible reading plan, have a daily quiet time. Well, you develop a habit of spirituality that has long-term consequences. Why is that important? I'll tell you why. Because what goes into you every day comes out of you every day. Garbage in, garbage out. Faith in, faith out. All the stuff that we take in from the things of God uh, circulate through our lives and, and nourish us and come out of us. So listen, if you come to church Sunday morning and you come to church Sunday night and Wednesday night and you read your Bible daily and you're praying daily and you try to keep these habitual things going, it will come out of your life. And if you avoid these things, it will come out of your life. I hope some of you are doing a reading plan this year. I'm doing the chronological one year Bible. So uh, today I'm, I'm reading, you know, the story of um, the patriarchs. I'm, I'm looking at Jacob as he's going to find a wife. We're getting right there in the chronological one-year Bible. He just had the issues with Esau, reading the chronological background of Esau's family. And so we're getting into that and move on. So that's a wonderful thing to be able to read through the Bible in a year. You might say, Brother, I don't have, I'm not a reader. So find another way to do it. Do it in something shorter. But find something where you get the Word of God in you every single day, right? Will there be a consequence for doing that? Yes, there will. Because you are what you eat spiritually. If you listen to a certain type of music, it's going to affect your, your attitude. If you watch certain types of movies, it's going to affect your attitude. If you read the Bible, it affects who you are. And understand this. What you are today, spiritually, you chose to be there last year and five years ago. You didn't know that, did you? But where you are today, you chose it in the past. And so what you choose today, you know what that's going to determine? Where you're going to be next year and in five years. Long-term 
consequences. I've been seeing all kind of news stories about the impact of the COVID lockdowns on our children. Can you imagine being a first grade student when all this started? Is it going to affect their reading ability in the rest of their lives? I want you to imagine you would have been a first grader in 20 uh, this past year, and now we're in the second year, full year of it. Imagine being that elementary student. A lot of those kids, that's going to have long-term consequences educationally for the rest of their lives. What happens in a short time determines what happens in the long term. Consequences of spiritual discipline. It says in Psalm 119.11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God, I read your word so that I don't sin against you, that I can pull up scriptures the rest of my life. Can you quote any scriptures? Can you quote any scriptures? I hope you can. Can you quote John 3.16 right now? Okay, that's an easy one. Could you give me the Roman road right now if I asked you to? Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10, 9 and 10 and 13. Could you do that? Hmm. Could you quote the Great Commission? Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Could you quote that? These are very basic to our faith. What could you quote? How much can you quote? How long have you been in church? I've been in church 40 years. How much can you quote? Church, listen to me. The Word of God, we've got to get it in us. We need to know it. Uh, yesterday, Donna, you know, I was at the funeral uh, for, for y'all to Bobby. And the pastor was quoting at the graveside. I knew exactly what he was quoting. He was quoting 1 Corinthians 15. He didn't say that. And as he is reading it, I'm quoting it in my head while he's quoting it out loud. But the perishable must put on the imperishable and the, in, the corruptible must put on the incorruptible. I mean, I, I've read that throughout my ministry and I've, I've had the privilege of the repetition of it because it's gone in me. Church, if you don't know the Word of God, listen to me. When trouble comes, what are you going to fall back on? Dr. Phil? You hear what I'm saying? What are you going to do? You're going to say, let me read Dear Abby today. Maybe she's got an answer in the newspaper. Your word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. You've got to internalize it because you put it in now because you never need to know when you're going to need to draw it out later. Acts 17 talks about that. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Read it every day day. Wow. Examining the scriptures every day. Getting new nuggets every day. I'll tell you why most Christians don't read the Bible. Because they're lazy. Most of the reason we don't do anything is because we're lazy. Is, is that not true? Most of the time we don't do things because we choose not to. We say, I just don't feel like it. If you're not reading the Bible and you've got 15 of them around your house and they're on your coffee table, on your bookshelves, on your nightstand, they're in your kitchen, you've got Bibles everywhere but in your heart. We must internalize it in the short run because there's long-term consequences of not internalizing the Word of God and not spending time with God in prayer. Did Jesus pray a lot? Yes, He did. He'd get up early in the morning, the Bible said, and He'd go out to isolated places before the sun would rise. On the week of His arrest, when He was in Jerusalem, it said that He would go to the Garden of Gethsemane at night and He would spend time in prayer. It was His habit I think of, the, of Daniel in the Old Testament. Remember when they got him arrested, which eventually led him to the lion's den. It said he prayed how many times a day? Anybody remember? Three. Three times a day, Daniel got down and he prayed, and that's what got him tossed in the lion's den. Disciplines of the spiritual life today determine where you're headed later. That's why it says in Galatians 6, 7, a man reaps what he sows. What you plant spiritually determines what you reap. 
spiritually. I found this years ago. It's a true statement. If you sow a thought, you'll reap an action. If you sow an action, you'll reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you will reap a character. If you sow a character, you will reap a destiny. Everything we sow determines the destiny of our lives. So, so far we've looked at sin and salvation. I can sow sin and reap destruction. I can sow salvation and reap eternal life. We, we're looking at the importance of being in the body faithfully, not haphazardly. And we're looking at the spiritual disciplines. And all of that is important. I want to look at another one. This one makes people less comfortable. What do you do with your money? Let's look at that. The long-term consequences of financial giving. Why is it important we talk about this? Is money an important part of your life? Do you think about money every day? Listen to me. You plan your schedule every day. What am I going to do this morning? What am I going to do this afternoon? What am I going to do tonight? Do you think about spending money every day? And the answer is yes. Everything that you plan throughout the day is important. And spending money is just the same. You've thought about money this morning. Absolutely you have. Some of you gave because it's your week to give. Some will give next week because you give maybe every other week or once a month. But you've thought about money. You've thought about paying bills this week. Got a car note. Got a house note. Got to pay the utility bill. The water bills do. You think about it all the time. Do you think about it in terms of the consequences of the kingdom of God? Because listen to me. Money matters in the kingdom of God. And if we're not careful, we talk about going to church weekly. A lot of churches in the long run will not survive unless in the short run we're thinking about the implications of our support. Uh, We're hearing about something in American culture today I never thought we would hear about, and it really troubles me. There is a rising acceptance in America in the area of socialism. More and more younger people as compared to older, because when we think of socialism at my age, we were thinking of the Soviet Union. You know, I remember going, I had free enterprise class in the 1980s. Y'all remember taking free enterprise? Anybody took that? It was a requirement in Louisiana. You had to take free enterprise. And they taught about capitalism, socialism, and communism. I remember all three of those. And, and capitalism was uh, independent ownership of everything by business. It's not owned by the government. And then socialism is more ownership of the capital by the government, and there's less uh, freedom. And then social- communism is the government runs everything. And, and you know what we're seeing in America today? We're seeing a move from a capitalistic culture to a more socialistic culture. You know what's becoming mainstream, and I don't want to insult our young people, but um, it's just part of it. Everyone needs to go to college for free. Folks, that's a choice, isn't it? I mean, uh, I don't want anybody to have student loans, but where, where does that kind of thing end? We need free housing for the homeless. I saw a show the other day was showing all these people in these tents in Los Angeles and San Francisco and all over the cities. And you've, this was in Chicago, I think. They were building a high rise for homeless people. And I'm thinking, you know what you're doing? You're just empowering homelessness and making it popular. I mean, we need to hand out and help people. But, but here's what that does. It carries over to the church because if I don't have to do anything to get something, then everything is free. Listen to me. Church is not free. Do y'all like these lights? Yeah, so you can see me better with lights. We got that camera, and we got live streaming, and we got, I think the heater's a good thing. Praise God for heaters. I, I turned those heaters on yesterday. I like that hot air blowing out of there. You see, without the hot air blowing out of there, you don't have the hot air blowing out of here. Amen? You know what I'm saying? Now, you get the point on what I'm saying. We've got insurance. South Louisiana. Insurance is expensive on our church, folks. Do you know this year we're going to pay $45,000 just in insurance on Bayou Vista Baptist Church? Well, over 10% of our church budget goes to insurance. I'm glad we have insurance because we have hurricanes in South Louisiana. When I was going down the cutoff yesterday, I was reminded you need insurance all the way down Highway 1. What's the long-term consequences of financial giving? Well, In socialism, there's dependence on somebody else to provide. But most of us were raised by, let's do our part. Let's do our fair share. 
Grace is free, but grace is costly at the same time. And so what am I trying to get at, Brother Steve? What are you trying to tell me to give? Absolutely. I think all of us should give. I think all of us should be regular givers. You see, here's the deal. And I I know this because I've, I've been in church my whole life. If I'm saved and I believe in eternal life through Jesus Christ alone, and I'm faithful to the house of God, and I go to Sunday school and Bible study, and I'm in youth group, and I've benefited from all those things. And by the way, we start renovation two weeks, one week from tomorrow. So we've had the benefit of that. And I'm reading my Bible daily, and I'm praying daily. Then the giving is just an extension of everything else. If I'm sowing all these other things, this should be a natural area where I'm sowing. But if I'm not consistent elsewhere, I'll not be consistent in that area. The long term of this ministry has to do with collective giving. Our statistics today, and this is not just our church, it's nationwide. The average church attender gives 2% of their income to the church. 2%. I was raised on 10%. We are raised on 10%. Average church attender in America, 2%. One-third of church attenders, according to statistics, do not give anything to the church, the work of God, on an ongoing basis. One-third give nothing. Now, let's just put those two statistics together. If most of our older people were raised on 10% and the modern standard is 2%, what does the future look like? What's the long-term consequences of that? We're in trouble if that's the truth. And if one-third give nothing, what's the consequences of that? You see, because here's what I believe as a pastor, and folks, I'm not trying to offend anybody. It's just the fact. As a pastor, I'm going to ask you to get right with Jesus, be faithful in his church, get in his word, and give your money, because comprehensively, that's what a Christian does. Give me total in the faith. Not that we pick what we like like we're in a cafeteria line. Uh, The book of Malachi deals with this. It's probably the best-known passage about financial giving. And here's what it says in verse uh, 8 of chapter 3. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Now, what stands out there, which I think is interesting, they say, how are we robbing you? Most people don't even think about this. There's an unawareness of the implications of giving in the house of God. And if you're a Christian, I'm probably t- I'm talking to you. Listen, if, if, if you're not serving God and you're not saved, I'm not talking to you because you need to get saved before you worry about this. So if you're not right with God, don't listen to me. I'm talking to Christians because this is your responsibility. Amen? If you say you love Jesus and you say you love his church and you say you love his word, this is your business. If you're not right with God, I'm not talking to you. You need to get saved first and you can deal with that later. Listen to me. Would a man rob God? How are we robbing you? Well, in tithes and offerings. Let me, let me think about this in terms of our church implications. Our, our 2022 budget is $329,000. We just started it. And by the way, we did great in 2021. What I'm telling you today is not about today. What I'm telling you today is the long-term consequences of this. I'm talking about 2025 and 2027 and 2030, Okay. I mean, I don't know who's going to be alive and who's going to be dead. I don't know if I'll be your pastor or not. I have no idea what the future holds. But what we decide today determines the ministry of the church in five years and seven years and ten years. Our current budget is $329,000. If in 2021 you were to take what you gave, many of you got your contribution statements, so think about what you gave in 2021. Divide what you gave into 329000 And that's how many of you we need to run this church. What do you mean, brother? Let's make it easy. Let's say you gave $1,000 last year. That means we need 329 active families just like you to keep the church going. Do we have 329 active families at Bayou Vista Baptist Church? Well, the average family is more than one. It's really two. So we need 658 people coming on Sunday. When was the last time we had 658 people, Brother Charles? Have we ever had 658 people? We couldn't fit them in the building. Do you hear what I'm saying, folks? Listen to me. If you just gave $1,000 last year and everybody gave $1,000 throughout the church, 
I mean, that's, a, that's about $20 a week. We would have to have 329 family units to just meet this year's budget. Well, what if you gave 2,000? We would need 165 family units. We don't have that. We'd, mean three, we'd have to average 330 at 2,000 a year to do that. What are you saying, Brother Steve? I'm saying there's a lot of people that give a lot, and there's a lot of people that don't give a lot, and we all need to do our part. Why? Because it's the long term. It's long term consequences. You see, we're building this youth renovation that we're going to be in soon. It's not for today, is it? It's for tomorrow. It's for the kids that are real, real young. I mean, the, the older ones get to use, but it's for, it's for the future. It says in Malachi 3.10, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be room in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. The key words there are whole tithe. Give the whole thing. Don't hold back. The whole thing. All of it. Faithfully. Why is that important? Because of the future. If I don't sow the seed of salvation, I'll live a life of sinfulness. If I don't sow the habit of church attendance, I'll reap a lifestyle of carnality. If I sow a lifestyle of neglect of the Word of God in prayer, I will reap a life disconnected from God. And then this whole financial thing is really not even an issue because if everything else doesn't reflect God's priority, neither will the giving. Let me just make very clear. Some of you just need to take this to heart. If your giving's poor, that means everything else is not up to snuff either. Hello? Your giving is a diagnostic tool about your heart. Because what does Jesus say? Where your treasure is, what? Your heart will be also. Today's not a message on the money. It's just that's part of the deal. What about the long term? And we're going to close with this. What you do today about these important issues are predictive of next year, five years, and ten years from now. So let me ask you this as we close. Have you sowed the seed of salvation? If not today, you need to do that because it will change the rest of your life. If you're a believer and you say, I'm saved, but I'm just hit and miss when it comes to the house of God, today you need to begin a new pattern and say, God, if I'm off of work and I have breath in my lungs, I'll be in God's house on Sunday. And not only that, starting today, I'm going to open the Word of God and I'm going to pray every day. God, today, starting today, I'm going to give you 10 to 15 minutes of my life. Every day. You just find a time that works for you. Morning people, night people, whatever works. Today, I'm going to start sowing the seeds of commitment. And starting now, and I'll do it on the way out, I'll drop it in the offering box. Today, I begin the giving pattern. I will start faithfully giving consistently because God has blessed me. The long term consequences of our walk with Him. Today, would you examine your life? Let's stand together. Tyler, would you come? Paul, would you join me up here? Maybe today you need to get saved. Just come down and say, Look, today I want to sow the seed of salvation. I want Jesus in my heart. That would be a great thing to do. Why don't you come?